In this video, we'll be going through the 2019 Mechanical Systems paper. Ellie and Chris are rollerblading. Assuming friction is negligible, which we like to do, the system of Ellie and Chris can be considered an isolated system in the horizontal direction, which basically means we can ignore anything vertical that's going on, such as gravity or any kind of reaction force with the road. State a relevant physical quantity that is conserved during a collision between Chris and Ellie. So when we're talking about collisions, we look primarily at momentum, and the reason for that is momentum is always conserved in collisions, provided there are no forces we're not considering. There are no external forces, in other words. So the quantity that we would most uh, readily consider is momentum. At one instant, Ellie stops and Chris collides with her. They move off at right angles to each other as shown in the diagram. Show that Ellie's speed after the collision is 1.71 meters per second. To start off, let's do a bit of a vector diagram, which should really kickstart uh, our approach to this problem. So if we consider that we have some momentum before the collision, and let's draw Chris's momentum before the collision, that's our total momentum before, that's our PI. In this case we'll just call that PCI, which is the momentum of Chris initially. That's the notation that I always use. Now because of conservation of momentum, and we can assume that there are no external forces, it kind of clued us into that in the setup for this question, this vector must equal the after vectors, so our vector of Chris upwards, so I'm drawing this one now, and our vector of Ellie, which goes downwards like this. So this is our momentum of Chris finally, and our momentum of Ellie finally. And we of course are given that it is a right angle between these two. It doesn't often happen in the real world, it's just a, a nice little thing that allows you to use simple right angle trigonometry. And by now you should hopefully see that we're heading towards a bit of Pythagoras, where PCI is our hypotenuse, and our PCF and our PAF are our opposite and adjacent. It doesn't matter which way around in this case. So, via Pythagoras, we can of course write PCI squared equals PCF squared plus PAF squared. Okay, so since we are interested in Ali's final momentum, and specifically her final velocity, I'm going to first rearrange this for Ali's final momentum. To do that, I'm going to roll two things into one. I'm going to subtract PCF squared from both sides, and I'm going to swap the sides around. I'm now going to square root both sides, which solves for Ellie's final momentum. And now, since we're interested in Ellie's final velocity, I'm going to replace the momentums with their masses times velocities. My final step in solving is to divide both sides by ma. Putting in our numbers. And I see I've already made a mistake in my working. This symbol here should be a minus. And that gives me 1.709737. Since I'm given three significant figures in the question, I'm going to round that to three significant figures, which gives me 1.71 meters per second. And that is indeed what we're trying to find, so that's always fortunate.
To save himself from falling, Chris sees a horizontal bar and grabs it. He swings on the bar in a vertical circle. Chris's motion can be simplified by analyzing the motion of his center of mass, which we see in this diagram over here, which is 0.7 meters from the bar. And we are asked to assume the effects of friction are negligible. The first question here asks us the minimum speed Chris's center of mass would need to have at the top of the vertical circle in order to swing up and over the bar. And we're assuming he continues in a circular path. So specifically, we're looking at the minimum speed and specifically at the top of the vertical circle. So of course this is a question on centripetal motion. And the specific situation at the top is that we have the only force at the top at the minimum speed is going to be the force of gravity. And being that at the minimum speed that will be the only force, the force of gravity will be the only thing providing the centripetal force. It will in fact be equal to the centripetal force. Now if he was going faster than this minimum speed, then we would start to have a kind of tension force in his arms, which would start to contribute. But of course, because we're looking at the minimum speed, this is our situation. So that is the mathematical statement that we are going to start with. Via your formula sheet, centripetal force is of course equal to mv squared over r. And gravity is just mass times gravity. Dividing both sides by mass, our masses cancel out. And we can multiply both sides by r to solve for our v squared, leaving us only with the need to square root in order to solve this for our v. Putting in our numbers, which gives me 2.620496. The question gives us three significant figures, so that's how I'm going to express my answer. Describe and explain the size and direction of the tension and weight forces at the bottom and top positions. Assume Chris swings over the top at minimum speed, and include the force labels in the diagram below to support your answer. Well, first of all, we established in the previous question that at this minimum speed, our force of gravity is equal to our centripetal force. Now, you should at this point know that the centripetal force isn't a force of itself. It is a role. It is a, a character that other forces play. In this case, at the top position, the gravitational force is playing the part of the centripetal force. You don't, if you're drawing the exact forces in a situation, you don't draw the centripetal force as just one other force. It is a role that the other forces are playing. At the bottom, we would have the gravitational force and it would be unchanged. We assume that it is the same as it was at the top. However, we need a centripetal force pointing upwards towards our bar here. We need a centripetal force. And so to get that centripetal force, we need a certain amount of tension force from the bar to overcome the gravitational force, and then a bit more to provide the centripetal force. So the tension force here is doing two jobs. It is countering gravity, and it is going above and beyond to provide the centripetal force. So that is our force of tension. And so mathematically, our tension force is both countering gravity, so it's got a force that is equal and opposite to gravity, but it is also providing the centripetal force that's required to keep the motion in a circle. So let's write that below. At the top position, there is no tension force at minimum speed. The only force is gravity downwards, which provides all of the centripetal force. At the bottom, the upwards tension force must both combat the downwards gravity and provide an upward centripetal force. Mathematically, at the top, the force of gravity is equal to the centripetal force, and at the bottom, the tension force is equal to gravity plus the centripetal force. 
Question two. Three children are playing on a merry-go-round with a rotational inertia of 271 kg meter squared. Once the children get the merry-go-round spinning, they stand evenly spaced around the outer edge. Each child has a mass of 28 kgs, and the merry-go-round has a radius of 2.10 meters. And we've got a better diagram over here. Assuming the rotational inertia of a child's mass on the edge of the disc is given by I equals mr squared, show that the rotational inertia of the system is 641 kg meter square. So essentially what we're doing here is we are taking the rotational inertia of our merry-go-round and we are adding the rotational inertia of the children. And we do that using the formula mr squared, where we need to multiply that by 3 because of course we have 3 children. So let's do that. Putting in our numbers. Which gives me 641.44. We're given 3 significant figures in the question, so we'll round that to 3 significant figures, which of course gives me 641 kg meter square, which is fortunate because that is exactly what we're trying to find. The total energy of the system is 388 joules. The first section here wants us to show that the angular velocity of the system is 1.1 radians per second, and we then need to show that the linear velocity is 2.31 meters per second. So to do this, we need to use the equation on your formula sheet that the rotational energy is equal to half I omega squared, where we are given the energy and we know the rotational inertia from the last question, so we just need to solve for our omega. To do that, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2 and divide by I. And now I'm going to swap both sides around, so I have the omega on this side, and then I'm going to square root both sides, which lets me solve for omega. Putting in our numbers. Indeed gives me 1.10, two three significant figures. And units of radians per second. Next up, we need to show the linear velocity is 2.31, which we can do knowing the radius is 2.1, as we've got from above here. So the radius is 2.1. I'll write that there so I don't have to scroll up for it. And on your formula sheet, you'll see that the linear velocity is equal to the radius times our omega, where we have our radius, we have our omega from the previous question, so we just need to put those numbers in. And that indeed gives me 2.31 exactly, and the units are of course meters per second. One child drags her foot on the ground to bring the merry-go-round to a stop in 2.8 seconds. Calculate the amount of torque produced by the foot. Let's start off by writing down what we know. So our time to stop is 2.8 seconds. Our final angular velocity is of course going to be zero because we're bringing it to a stop. And our initial angular velocity is 1.1 radians per second as we found above. And so here we're going to do two things. To find the torque, we're going to use the equation that the torque is equal to inertia times angular acceleration. You can think of this as Newton's second law, but for rotation. Where we do know the inertia, that's what we found way up here, and that's 641. but we don't know our angular acceleration there. To find that, we're going to have to use a rotational kinematic equation. 
and the one that will fit our purpose is omega f equals omega i plus alpha t. Where since our omega f here is zero, we can just make that equal to zero. And now to solve it, we just need to firstly subtract omega i from both sides, and now divide both sides by t. Putting in our numbers, gives me negative 0.3928, so I'm going to make that negative 0.393. We of course see that our value is negative, which reflects the fact that this is deaccelerating. Okay, coming back onto this column, we now have both our rotational inertia and our angular acceleration, so we just need to put in those numbers. Which gives me negative 251.91, rounding that to three significant figures, gives me negative 252, and units of Newton meters. Now, the fact that I have a negative sign here is really just convention. It doesn't really come in handy or become particularly relevant in this problem. It's really just showing that the angular acceleration and the torque is in the opposite direction to our initial angular velocity, which we decided to make positive from the outset. The children get the merry-go-round spinning once again at a constant angular speed. Then each child moves inwards towards the center of the merry-go-round. Using physics principles, explain the effect this has on the rotational energy of the system. So this is a very typical question. It's put to you in a range of different contexts. It might be a planet collapsing down to a neutron star. It might be a figure skater drawing her arms in, but basically it amounts to the rotational inertia of a system decreasing. And because of conservation of angular momentum, the rotational velocity increases. So let's try and put that into words. The children moving inwards reduces the rotational inertia of the system. As angular momentum is conserved, and angular momentum is equal to the rotational inertia times the angular velocity, if the rotational inertia decreases, the angular velocity must increase. Rotational energy is given by E equals half I omega squared. Since I decreases in proportion to omega's increase, the fact that omega is squared means that the energy must increase. Question 3. J is enjoying a swing at the playground. The period of one oscillation is 2.4 seconds and J maintains a constant amplitude of 0.31 meters by swinging her legs back and forth to replace the energy lost due to friction. The mass of the system is 70 kg. J's motion can be considered simple harmonic motion. Calculate the maximum velocity of J and the swing. So the maximum velocity, and this is going to be a, a few parts here, the maximum velocity is given by a omega. Now, we of course don't know omega, but we do know that omega is equal to 2 pi f. Now, we also don't know the frequency, but we do know that the frequency is equal to 1 over the period, and we do know the period that's given to us as 2.40 up here. So we can write instead of 2 pi f, 2 pi divided by t. So if we substitute our 2 pi divided by t in place of our omega over here, we get 2 pi a divided by t. Putting in our numbers, gives me 0 0.81157. Because we are given three significant figures in the question, I'm rounding that to three significant figures, which means that's 0 0.812, and it's a velocity, so it's meters per second. 
use a reference circle or other method to determine how much time J's displacement is greater than 0.2 meters from equilibrium over one period. Okay, so let's first start by writing down everything we are given. Okay, let's draw a reference circle, or at least I'll do my best attempt at a circle. All right, that's about as good as that's going to get. And so the displacement that we are interested in is 0 0.2 meters. So if our total amplitude is 0 0.31, then that means that this distance here is our 0 0.31. And so let's say our 0 0.2 is roughly about here. And symmetrically down the bottom. So we want to know the time here and the time there. And so if we can think of this here as a right angle triangle, it's always handy when we have those, we want to determine this angle here. Because that angle here is going to give us the proportion of our 90 degrees that we are over our 0 0.2. If we multiply that by 4, then we get our total angle over which we are over our 0 0.2, and then we can simply do a bit of ratios to relate that to the period and find the time. So let's, let's get down this pathway. This is a, a doozy of a question. So if we drag my triangle here out, we know that this length here is 0 0.2 meters, and the hypotenuse here, this Hypotenuse is our amplitude, so that is 0 0.31. Which means we have the adjacent and the hypotenuse, which means we want to use our ka in our Sokotoa. Cosine of our angle is equal to our adjacent, which is 0 0.2, divided by our hypotenuse, which is 0 0.31. Solving that for our angle is just a matter of taking the inverse sine of both sides, which gives me 0 0.8695 radians. And I'm going to round that to three sig figs, which gives me 0 0.870. Now, note, of course, that this angle that we've just found is really a quarter of our total angle above the 0 0.2, so I'm just going to note that in now so we don't get confused about that. On your formula sheet, you'll see the handy equation that our omega is equal to our angle over our time. Rearranging this for time. And replacing our theta, our angle, with four times our quarter angle. Putting our numbers in. Now we didn't actually calculate our angular velocity, so let's just go upstairs and do that. So if we put in our numbers, we have our 2 pi divided by our period. Our period is 2.4. Put that into our calculator, and I get 2.62, which gives me 1.3282 which I'm going to round to three significant figures and gives me 1.33 seconds. J stops swinging her legs when the swing is at its maximum displacement. On the grid below, sketch a graph of her displacement over the next three periods. Include values for the time and for the initial displacement at t equals zero. So there's a couple of things that they're wanting to see here. They're wanting to see that you've started from the correct initial displacement. 
and that you've shown an understanding that the wavelength over time isn't going to change, and so that the period over time should not change either. So our period was 2.4 seconds. So I'm just going to mark that every 5, which I'm doing somewhat arbitrarily, but I am going to indicate that that is 2.4 seconds which should keep the markers happy. Now our initial displacement is going to be our amplitude of 0 0.31. And we can just start up here and just mark that down that that is 0 0.31 meters. And so if I just sketch out where I want my peaks to go, we want this to reduce over time. Let's say I want it reducing in this kind of a pattern. Doesn't really matter as long as you show that it has some sort of kind of exponential decrease. And let's try and, and make that symmetrical on the other side. I'm not going to worry too much about that though. Essentially, whenever you do any kind of diagram like this, it is a sketch. Don't, don't bother busting out your ruler for it. And if we kind of complete our dotted lines, and that should be good enough. J moves to a new swing that is a tire hanging vertically on a single chain. The system is a conical pendulum. J travels at 2.6 meters per second, around a circle of radius 0 0.411. The total mass of J and the swing is 70 kgs. Assume friction and the mass of supporting chain are negligible. Calculate the tension in the chain supporting the swing and the angle of the chain from vertical. Okay, so if we're going to do our force diagram on our tire here, which looks suspiciously like just a ball, but hell, we'll call it a tire. We'll have a tension force pulling upwards here, and we'll call that FT, force of tension, give it a little vector hat. We'll of course have a force of gravity going downwards. And I'm going to like tentatively put this in as like a dotted force. Dotted because it's not a force that actually exists, it's a role that a force plays. In this case, it's the tension force, but that is the centripetal force, okay? So the centripetal force is not a force that actually exists in itself, it is a role that other forces play. Nevertheless, we're going to make a sweet little right angle triangle out of that. So if we look at our tension force, and we've got that going up at that angle there, the vertical component of this tension force is countering gravity. It's stopping the tire from being pulled down. And so it is in fact equal to gravity. And the horizontal component here, the leftover component, the unbalanced component, is providing the centripetal force. So this is our tension force, this is our gravity force, and this is our centripetal force. We have a right angle between our centripetal force and our gravitational force. And so the angle that we're trying to find is of course this angle here. It is the angle between the gravitational force and the tension force. Now, out of these three forces, the forces that we can most readily calculate is the gravitational force here. We can do that knowing just the mass here and multiplying that by the gravitational acceleration, 9.81. And the centripetal force here we can find rather easily just by knowing that it's going at this speed and it's got that radius and mv squared divided by r is going to be that force. We'll get onto that in a moment. So... We have here our adjacent and our opposite, which means we are going to use tan. That tan of our angle that we're trying to find is equal to our opposite side, which is in this case our centripetal force, divided by 
our gravitational force, our adjacent. Now, to find our gravitational force, our gravitational force, Fg, is just our mass times gravitational acceleration. And both of those we have, we'll just throw that into one big happy equation in a moment. And our centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r, all of which we have, and whoop, fc, and we'll throw that into our equation now. And so it'll be a nice big fat algebraic mess, but we will at least get mass cancelling out quite nicely. So let's solve for our angle and make our substitutions for our forces. So our angle is, of course, our inverse tan, fc over fg. Substituting our values for our forces that we've just written up here. Where our masses cancel out, and we didn't even need that 70 kgs. In fact, I don't recall using the 70 kgs at any point in this exam. And doing a little bit of simplification, our r can live down the bottom with our g. Now all that's left is to put in those numbers. Which gives me 59.379. Rounding that to three significant figures, because that's what we're given, that's 59.4 degrees. Always check that your calculator is in radians or degrees, depending on where it should be. That will be one thing that will trip you up a hell of a lot of the time if you're not paying attention. And we're done. Not so fast. This is future Mr. Wibbly, who is just at the end of editing this video, and has realized that the question also asks for the actual value of the tension force. So as this is, this is only a merit level answer. We need to find the value for the tension force. And there are a number of ways that we can do this now that we have the angle 59.4. So I'm going to take the fact that I know Fg, which is the adjacent angle, and then I'm finding Ft, which is the hypotenuse, and I also know the angle. So given that I have adjacent and hypotenuse, I'm going to use ka, that cosine of the angle, which we just found out, is the adjacent, which is our force of gravity, divided by our tension force, which we need to find. Solving that for our tension force, and substituting mg for our fg. We now just need to put in our numbers. And what do you know, we actually did need to use the 70 kgs somewhere. Which gives me 1349, rounding that to three significant figures, gives me 1350. Newtons. And now we're finished.